So I'd like, first of all, to thank you all for being with me here, for the invitation I got with Dr. Akram, and thanks for the opportunity of showing my work for you now today. This is something that I love to do, to talk about elasticity and orthodontics. This is something that I love to, to say to my, my colleagues that elastics are very important for us because they are cheap, because they are effective, and we don't need sometimes to use that those fancy mechanics with, uh, for example, tabs or things like that, because we have the elastics. Sometimes I think the elastics are underestimated in our practice. And this is why I love to talk about, because many of my, my colleagues here in Brazil, many of my students here, they, don't, they can't afford those kind of TEDs, very expensive TEDs in those day-to-day -day practice. So I like to talk about it because something that we can do in our, in our offices, we can do uh, with our patients to get the, 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 best, the, the best outcome that we can using just, just this simple resource, which is the use of elastic and orthodontics. So I'm going to show it to you now. Let me just pass here uh, our presentation. So we don't have much time to talk about other things, unfortunately, but let me show to you my country, where I live, where I, I do my classes, where I do my work. This is Brazil. This is a huge country, as you know, as you, as you probably know. And this is where I live. This is Salvador, Bahia. This is the place where I'm speaking now, from where from I'm speaking now with you. And here is just for you to have a glimpse of my, my city. This is the landscape of my city from a, a plane, a beautiful city we live here and other posts. This is the, the best thing of, of our landscape. Our sea is very beautiful, our ocean is very beautiful and our sky is also very beautiful, blue sky, especially during the summer. This is where I work, this is my place. This, is, this place here is where I'm speaking from here now. And just for you to know how far we are one from each other, this is Brazil, this is Bahia, and this is your beautiful country. We are a little bit far one from each other, uh, but we have the opportunity to, to, to join here now this, in this kind of meeting. So guys, let's move on. Uh, let's talk about elastics and the most common uses of elastics. Of course, we don't have time to speak of everything concerning elastics in our practice, but I hope I can show to you some situations that are important for you to use in your day-to-day -day practice. The most important thing for me to start the, our, our talk is about the magnitude of the force. Because sometimes people just talk about the, the size of the elastics. What kind of size do you use? My students do it often. So sometimes they come to me and say, Professor, what kind of elastic I'm going to use in this situation? And I, I would reply, please, Bring the patient, bring the patient's mouth so I can do the measurement, so I can measure the force and we can go on. So this is very important. We sometimes, we, I think orthodontists think that we have a dynamometer embedded in, 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 in our self, in our own hands. It's not true. We know that we have to, to do, to do the, the measurement every time the patient comes to our office and to assess if we're doing the right amount of force and we can do that just stretching the elastics and just seeing the force in our hands. We have to use for that a dynamometer so we can measure the force, so we can work in this uh, safe field of using the right force for uh, uh, each kind of treatment that we, we like to use, okay? So we know that uh, the intermaxillary elastics, when we use a lot of force, because it is a high force, it can apply a higher force and it is a force that is not a constant force. And so this is something that can happen to our patient if, it, if you don't use the right amount of force during the retraction, during the, the movement you are intending to do. So this is something that is important. Uh, the excess of force can lead to increased pain and can lead to root resorption. So of course we, we want to avoid it uh, at all costs, okay? So uh, when you use elastics, for, for example, doing the retraction of the whole arch, 
what kind what is the amount of force that we use what is the amount of force that we are allowed to use in this kind of situation is that something that is general everybody says the same thing no it's not we go to the the books and we see different uh information and we go to the articles and we can't see enough information about the amount of force you can use but we know that when we are doing the retraction for example of the whole arch we can use something like 300 and, and uh, 350 uh, grams per side so we can do that in both sides we are doing the retraction and i'm going to show to you that the retraction is one of the results that we have when we use this this kind of elastic as an orthodontist so we have many many information of course we have it and but not that kind of information that we get that we want that kind of scientific information we don't have enough basis of say that to say that this is the most the, the safest way to do the retraction with the elastics using this amount of force of or that amount of force most of the information comes from books and we know for example prophets told us that uh 300 and a half 350 grams is enough to do the retraction of the whole arch and if you're doing uh, a more direct retraction, for example, of one teeth, one tooth, for example, a canine, we can we, we need to lower this amount, this magnitude of force. But we what do we do we have when we do the retraction when you use, for example, class two elastics? Of course, the most used in orthodontic pra practice, since we have about 50% of class two patients, something like that. We use it a lot in our practice. So what do we want? What is intended to do when we do the retraction? And what, what do we have? What we really have when we do the retraction with those elastics? Let's see it now. Well, uh, the, the force of the, the class two elastics come from the, the posterior part of the lower arch to the anterior part of the upper arch. So what we want is to do the retraction of upper arch and we know that we have the mesialization of the lower arch. But out of that, we have side effects that are most of the time unwanted in our practice, which uh, are the vertical uh, components that we have during the use of those class two elastics. So what can we do in order to avoid or to minimize this uh, vertical component? And what did this vertical component do to our patients, for example, having a hyper, hyper divergent pattern of growth. What does, does we, what do we do to those patients using this kind of elastics? Some people use it a lot uh, for those patients. I really avoid doing this kind of elastics in growing patients and patients with hyper, hyper divergent pattern. So what we are going to see now is the, the components that we have using this kind of elastics we have a distal component on the anterior, an anterior extrusion in maxilla, a mesial component and extrusion and the posterior part of the mandible and a clockwise rotation of the, the, the crucial plane. So if we have, for example, a convex patient with a class two relationship, with a class two relation, what is going to happen to this patient when we use this class two elastics? And if this patient is already too, very, too, too vertical, if this patient has already a lower anterior face height, excessive lower anterior face height, what are we going to achieve at the end of the treatment? So when you do the measurement, when you do the uh, assessment of the patient's um, features, we can use this many, many possibilities, of course, but I use mostly the, the, the assessment of Arnett and Bergman. And I used to, to, to do this with my patients, to do these measurements directly to those faces, to their faces. And I'm going to show you in some cases I have. And here we have the mandible being part of the problem. The most, uh, uh, the, the, the majority of the problem in this case here that I'm, I, I did this kind of uh, diagram is located in the mandible, not in the maxilla. So, of course, the best possibility for this kind of patient is a mandibular advancement. And you can do this either by means of a stimulation, if you believe that, that it happens, it really happens, uh, during growth or doing that later on using the, the surgical approach for that. So, but 
I know, and you know that many of our patients, they don't want to go to surgery. They don't want, they, they really avoid uh, the possibility of surgery and they want to do a, uh, a, a treatment that's more simple and without the need of doing this kind of aggressive approach. I do a lot of surgery here in Brazil, but I know many of my patients, they really avoid this kind of treatment planning. So if we want to do a compensation in this patient, one of the possibilities is doing the mesialization of the lower arch and the distalization of the upper arch. So if we had the opportunity to do that, because sometimes you don't have it, sometimes you have the lower teeth, the anterior lower teeth already through propline. So this is one of the, 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 the situation that we can't use the, the class two elastics or uh, the, the um, mandibular pro, uh, protractors, for example. So, because we know that we are going to have the side effect of more protrusive incisors at the end of our treatment. So this patient, uh, I consider a very a beautiful profile, um, even though she has this kind of a convexity, but for women, we, we consider that a beautiful profile. But you, you, want, you want to do the correction, you want to correct the class two. So you do the class two elex, elastics in this case. And if you use for that round wires, this is much, much worse. So we have to avoid doing retraction. First, with round wire, second, with patients that has uh, already a lower, a increased lower anterior face height because it's going to go further than that. It's going to increase the lower anterior face height and it's going to show, this patient's going to show more incisor during, uh, uh, in the, the, the rest position and during the smile as Dr. Flavia Artesi beautifully showed before me. So this kind of situation, uh, it will lead this patient to this situation here with extrusion of anterior upper arch and extrusion of posterior lower arch during the, rota the, the, the rotation of the mandibular plan, during the rotation, doing the rotation of the occlusal plan and showing more incisor after treatment. So after that, doing that, we'll have the correction of the class two, which is very good, but we will have a worsening of the face profile, which is very bad. We're going to show at the end of the treatment and lower uh, lip protrusive, more protrusive than upper lip, which is very bad. And if we compare the treatment, pre-treatment with the post-treatment, we'll have a, this situation. But sometimes patients don't see that, you can say that, but I don't want to do a treatment to put a patient in a lower position and this kind of beautiful, uh, beautiful scale. So we want to do the treatment, a dental treatment, of course, but we have to avoid uh, side effects, bad side effects to the face. So I would recommend, I would strongly recommend that you avoid to do this kind of treatment, this kind of elastics in a hyperdivergent patient with already showing a lot of uh, incisor during uh, uh, lip uh, rest uh, in the rest position and because we'll have a worsening of this profile of the, the smile after treatment. So this is something that I really, really avoid to do. So class two, correct, but the face now has a different uh, position of lower and upper lip, which is not beautiful, which I don't like at all. So this is how we do the comparison pre and post. And here, as this two drawings show, we have before treatment, I think it's a very um, much, much beauty than the, 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 the end of treatment. So this is something that we have, we need to avoid. Class two elastics in hyperdivergent patients uh, is very dangerous. So if you can avoid that, please avoid. This is what I did a long time ago with a patient with a class two situation and I did the elastics as you can see at the end of treatment, I had this situation which patient didn't comply at all because, because she didn't see that. But when I do the comparison pre and post treatment, I'm not happy at all because I can see that the face now is uh, the, the, the upper lip is a little more retrusive now than it was before treatment. So 
This is what I did before and I wouldn't do it now. Sometimes patients want to do that, even though they know that they will have this kind of feature at the end of the treatment, this kind of uh, retrusive leap at the end of treatment, we allow, we, 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 we say this to them, we say that, but they want to do the treatment because they don't want to do the surgery. But I really avoid to do that because I have a strong belief that when we do a treatment, when we, we perform a treatment in our patients, we sign our names on their faces. So I don't want to sign my name anymore in this kind of uh, outcome, doing the retraction of the upper lip and showing at the end of treatment less lip, less upper lip than before. So I would try to do another kind of treatment plan in such situations, okay? So class two, hyperdivergent, showing already a lower anterior face height, a increased lower anterior face height, try to avoid that. But do we have possibility of a lowering this side effect? What do we do in order to control this vertical component, in order to, in, to uh, lower this vertical component during the, the use of class two elastics? As you know, we have the, the possibility of seeing, almost directly seeing the vertical component by the means of the angulation of the elastic. So if we don't want to do the math, and this is something that I know many of us don't really want to do, to do the math, to, do, to, to, to know exactly the components, the vertical and the horizontal components, which is possible to do, but we know that, that we just looking at the angulation of those elastics, if we have less angulated elastic, we will have a more horizontal component uh, and a less vertical component. So, we can increase the span between the, the, the point of application and the point of origin of the force in order to, to change this kind of geometry of the, the elastic. So we can do either the, the putting more distal in the lower, in the lower arch and more mesial in the upper arch. We can do this kind of play with this kind of uh, changing the position of our hooks. So we have here, a more horizontal, compo horizontal component increased in this situation. But you can do more than that. We can do something like this, for example, putting the line of force, line of action of the force, more horizontal, almost completely horizontal, using, for example, a sliding jig for that. So this is something that I do very, very often. And this is the sliding jig that I use to do this kind of uh, changing the angulation of the elastics to uh, increase the horizontal component and decrease the vertical components. It's not eliminated, but it's, dim, it's uh, lowered the, the vertical components. Here I'm showing how to do. I use the, a uh, 20 stainless steel for that to do this kind of slide G. And here's the elastic when it's put uh, in the mouth. So as you can see, when patient opens his mouth or her, her mouth, they will have this vertical components still uh, in place. But most of the time, the horizontal components, the greatest component that we will have in this kind of situation. So we have here different displays of the class two elastics. And as you can see, this is where we have the, lo the, the, the lowest level of vertical components, meaning extrusion. Okay, so this is a clinical case in which I use this kind of concept. So we have this retreatment, this patient was treated before, and we have this class two sub sub subdivision uh, on the left, on the right side. In this situation, we'll have to do the retraction. Look, people, I'm not saying that you're going to do this kind of uh, uh, protocol in all of these patients of class two subdivision patients, because we know that sometimes these class two subdivisions are due to the asymmetric uh, growth of the mandible. No, I'm not saying that for you. I'm saying that in this situation, when you do the diagnose, the correct diagno diagnosis, and you see that the component, the dental component is what is uh, uh, creating the class two, not a bone, not a bone displacement, not a real asymmetry, when you know that this is just dental 
we do this kind of treatment. So what are we going to, to correct here? The class two on the, left, the, the, the right side, and we have to keep the class one to maintain the class one on the uh, left side. So for that, we have to do our diagnosis, our facial diagnosis, and I use for that this template that I, that I use, that I use and I teach to my students how to do. It's very simple, actually. And we do the, uh, the, the symmetry and we see and assess the symmetry of position of the canines and the, the posterior teeth. And we have here this asymmetry in the position of the canines. And we can do this kind of retraction just in the, uh, the, the right side, okay? So in this situation, it's very common that we have this kind of cant to the, 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 the arch. When you have a class two subdivision, it's common that we have this kind of positioning higher in the class two side than in the, the class one side because the position here is steep against steep. We don't have here the settlement that we can achieve in a class one position. So for doing this retraction, we can use a more vertical, vertical component because the extrusion is allowed in this side here because we have a higher position of the, the zenith of the gingival margin of the canine comparing to the other side. So we can do the extrusion here. And for that, we used a class two elastics directly uh, uh, engaged to the canine. And for doing the retraction, I use this class two elastic, more horizontal class two elastic with a cross, with a spring, a compressed spring to help the distalization of the second mold. So a very simple tool to use. We don't, if we can allow the, the medialization of the lower arch, this is a very, very good uh, protocol to use uh, in order to avoid to do, for example, TED, for example, extra alveolar, ICCs and, uh, and mini implants or mini plates for that. Of course, you can use, I love to use them. I love to use mini plates. I love to use mini implants, but sometimes just this, this kind of this tool here, it's uh, uh, enough to do the, 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 the correction of the arches, the correction of the relation and to do a very good outcome for the treatment. So here we have the compressed coil spring doing the distalization of the second molar. And the first molar, as you can see here, it's in a distal, it has a distal component, which is applied directly through this kind of elastic. This elastic here applies from second lower molar to the slide G and it uh, transfer the force, the distal force to the first molar. So in order to achieve a better uh, a more, a more faster, a faster correction. We did this kind of elastic here. This class two directly applied to the canine. So let's move on. And as you can see, here is the uh, diagram of forces. And here we have a distalization of the upper arch and a medialization on the lower arch. So sometimes you can't afford it. Sometimes you can't allow the, the medialization of the lower arch with flaring of the incisor. So if you can't do that, you either can use in the lower arch a, a mini implant for doing the, the anchorage of the lower arch, or you can do the retraction just in the upper arch using for that a TED, for example, a mini implant, a, a extra alveolar, or a mini plate for that. So everything has to be thought and everything has to be individualized for each patient each diagnose, okay? So we have here a uh, second month of distalization. As you can see, patient was wearing the elastic beautifully. So we had the, the outcome that we needed, that we wanted. And here we have the, the vertical elastics applied in this uh, part of the treatment, okay? So we have here the triangular elastics. As you can see, I love to use them. I love to use elastics and the, the refinement of the occlusion with torques, with bands and everything. So at the end of treatment, we have a more horizontal displacement of the, the position of the, the gingival margin, the canine gingival margin, because we have now a better settlement here in the right side of the occlusion as the left side 
uh, as to the left side, we kept the position of those, those teeth using a vertical elastic, a triangular vertical elastic here, because in order to keep the position of those teeth, we can't uh, let them without elastics. We use elastics, but with a different displacement with a different design. In this case, a vertical elastic with a triangular component, one or two triangular elastics on the left side in order to keep the intercuspation, okay? So we have here pre and post treatment. As you can see, we have the correction, pre and post treatment comparing the, uh, the correction of the midlines and the position of the canines also corrected just using for that the simple research resource elastics using in the right situation. Here we have pre and post. And of course, as I showed you before, we have the position of the canines. Same thing here, another possibility using the elastic in this kind of displacement, in this kind of, uh, uh, in this kind of position. Let me show it to you. We have also here a class two subdivision we have class two on the left, the right side and class one on the left side. And now I'm going to do the correction on the left, the right side using the elastics. And for that, I love to use horizontal elastic. So we can either use this kind of elastic using this hook upwards, uh, direct upwards, or we can change it because we want to do the the lower, we, we, we want to lower the vertical component. And for that, we can just do a simple thing as just uh, put upside down the hook in order to have a more horizontal component here. So now this is what we did for this patient. And let me show it to you. Here we have the clinical situation, second molar to the hook, which is upside down. And now, to the, the left side, we have the vertical components of the triangular elastic, the intercuspation elastics. There's something that people ask me uh, too often about this. Why don't I use in this kind of situation, or, or if I use in this kind of situation, a, uh, a bite ramp here, in the posterior part of the arch, is it possible to use that in order to do a faster correction? Sure it is, of course it is, but there's a problem in the situation. If you do this kind of bite wrap here, you will have a more, uh, dis uh, the, the displacement of the mandible downwards, okay? So you have this space here. If you use this kind of elastics, a vertical elastic in the, in the side, which is class one, you will have the extrusion on this side and you, have, you will have the tendency of generating a cant to the arch. So this is something that you want to avoid. So this kind of situation, you don't need to use the bite ramps in the posterior, okay? Please don't do that because when you do that, you will have different, different uh, components of, the, of the, 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 the force here. More vertical here, more horizontal here, so you can generate this kind of cant in the arch wire. So avoid doing that. Here we have the class two elastics being uh, used in the right side. So another thing that is important that when you use this kind of elastic, we are doing the retraction of the upper arch or either retraction of the upper arch and mesialization of the lower arch. So the tendency we have here is to lose very fast the inclination on the upper arch. So doing the retraction, using elastics, using retra a direct retraction to the arch, using for example, TEDs, you have to control the torque of the anterior uh, teeth. So in order to do that, we do a active torque, active relative buccal crown torque to avoid the, loose, the, the, the loosening of the inclination of those teeth. So this is something that we do. And if we do the retraction and do the, the, the loss of inclination, we have to be aware all the time about the contact between upper and lower incisors. So once they are, con they are in contact, we can't move on doing the, the elastic. We have to stop our treatment. So look that all the time when patients come back to your office. You have to look, you have to see, you have to assess if there is a contact between upper and lower incisors. So if there is, you have to stop the retraction, you have to stop using the elastics 
Otherwise, you're going to increase the contact and you can put your patient in jeopardy of those teeth to have root resorption. So stop the retraction and you correct the position of the, the anterior teeth doing both. To the upper arch, you do the, 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 the correct torque, you correct the torque, and to the lower arch, you can do a IPR, for example, in order to retract. But the first thing here you have to keep in mind, the first thing I'm going to do is to correct the torque. If I have to do the IPR in the lower arch, I do it later because I'm doing something that is irreversible. Once I'm doing the IPR, I, can, I can't go, go backwards. So this is something that we do if we don't have another option. So first of all, do the correction of the upper arch during the retraction using the torque for that. So correcting the torque, the active torque now is in position. So we wait till the correction occur. And after that, we can move on with our retraction. So this is how we do in our day-to-day -day practice. First of all, accept to assess the torque to see if the torque is okay. And after so, moving to this uh, slide, with what we do is do the correction first and after the correction, after we made the correction, we can move on. So this is just a situation where it's very common. We do the retraction. Sometimes our patients, sometimes our, our students, they say, Professor, I'm not being able to do the retraction. There are two or three months that I'm doing the retraction, but nothing happens. And I ask them, are you looking to the contact between the upper and lower? Because as I can see here, it is in contact. So this is something that we have to keep in mind. Anytime we, do the, we see the patient, we have to do this kind of assessment to see if there is a contact. And if there is, we have to stop our retraction. And after that, we can do the correction, okay? So let's see the clinical case here. Uh, so we run the sequence of arch wires and the same thing here is a class two subdivision. The canine margin in one side is higher than the other side and it's expected to happen in this situation. So we have to correct that also. So here we have the, the position of the canine, the position of the, the, the elastics and uh, using class two elastics, I just use them to do the correction of the whole arch. When I use the rectangular arch, rectangular, rectangular arch wire for that, I'm sorry. And when I do the rectangular arch wire, I can do the, 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 the torque control. So before that, it's impossible. So I really, really avoid to do the retraction of the whole arch I'm, I'm speaking of. I'm not speaking of the retraction of a canine, for example, because I'm doing, if I'm doing the retraction of a canine, I can use the round wire for that. I can use a stiff round wire for that. For example, O18 or O20, because I'm doing the retraction of just one tooth. I'm not doing a retraction of the whole arch wire, which I have to have the torque control for that. So I run the sequence once I reach a rectangular, arch wire, so I start with the correction of the, the retraction of the whole arch wire. 350 grams for that. And here we have the end of treatment and we have the outcome. We have the intercourse patient, a nice intercourse patient. And we have also the correction of the gingival margins, okay? Which were displaced before. So now we have, sorry, came back. And now we have pre and post treatment, uh, seeing the correction and seeing the correction of the margins. Okay. So uh, another thing that I would like to call you the, the attention is that the class two, some people say for me, professor, class two is not stable, elastics are not stable. And sometimes we have, they relapse, we have a fast relapse. But the most important thing here is what are you doing as a protocol of using the elastics? Are you weighing the right time? Are you doing the right assessment of the mandible? So sometimes people just don't see that happening and just uh, they blame the elastics for this fast relapse, but they are innocent. I'm, not, I'm going to show you now some tips that are important in order to assess if the correction is stable or not. So first of all, we do the correction, Yes, we do the correction, but sometimes 
what we have is a, just a displacement of the mandible forward. We have a dual bite. Sometimes the patient is a very so used to putting the mandible forward that we can even uh, achieve the possibility of doing this kind of correction to see to assess the the, the right position of the condyle. So he's used to doing this displacement, this forward displacement, and he or she wouldn't go back with the mandible. And sometimes we don't have the correction. We have just a dual bite. And you just see the patient to say, just please bite for me to see if you're okay, if you, the class two is correct, but it's not corrected yet. It's just a position of the mandible displaced forward. So first thing, assess the centric relation. Every time patient come back to your office, you have to assess the centric relation. Is it real or is it just an illusion? Is it real, the correction? Is it the teeth going forward in the lower arch and backwards in the upper arch? Or is it just a displacement of the mandible? So in order to do that, you have to assess the position, the centric relation position. So now we have a real position of the mandible. So this is something that sometimes you don't use. Sometimes you don't do, and it's very bad for our treatment because we are blaming the elastics. We are uh, doing that without assessing the right position of the mandible. Another thing to do after having the correction of the position of the, those teeth, correcting the class two for a class one position, what we have when we use elastics. Same thing applied to orthodontics always. What we do is do the tension, in one side of our alveolar uh, socket, and we have compression on the other side. We have tension and compression here, and we have the orthodontic movement go, uh, taking place. And we know that sometimes what we have is just the, the, the displacement of those teeth because of this compression, but it's not already uh, stable because we don't have the, the bone growth and we don't have the renewal of the periodontal fibers, which is, are still stretched. So this is something that we have to keep in mind. After doing the correction, let, let us see now how it happens. After, after doing the correction, we'll have to wait for having the bone growth here and for having the renewal of the periodontal fibers in order to have the stability of the position of those teeth, okay? So we have the pressure side, in one side and the tension side on the other side, but we don't have stability yet. I love this image here. It shows exactly what happens when we're using a class two elastic when patients are wearing the class two elastics as they have to, they need to. So we have here the tension side, which is larger, and we have here the compression side where we have a very thin uh, uh, space here. So in order to achieve stability, we have to wait. So if you don't do that, what we are going to see is this and is very fast. So we have to keep the elastics for another three months because in, this, in those three months, we will have a patient will have the, the new gro the growth of the bone. So stabilize, stabilizing the position and we'll have the renewal of the periodontal fibers. We know that in 45 days, we have completely renewal of the periodontal fiber 